So I'm uh, Karine Dumit and I'm the editor of the film. I'm Ahmed El Gindi and I'm one of the performers in the film and I work with dance and theater and performance. Uh, I'm Mohamed Chawi Hassan. I'm uh, the director of uh, the Shtalak site. Shall I compare you to A Summer's Day? Um, it's a contemporary queer musical um, that um, uh, 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 uses uh, the storytelling techniques of 1001 Nights uh, and pop music in a contemporary setting. Hi, welcome to the Teddy TV. My name is Jean Borbobak, and this time we are discussing the film Shall I Compare You to a Summer's Day? Hello, welcome to the festival, welcome to the Teddy. We are very happy to have you here with us today and to talk about the film. Um, let's start with, uh, with inspiration behind the work and the references that you that you consulted for constructing the narrative? Um, okay, so um, work on the film started a bit over three years ago and um, I knew that I was interested, actually started with one story and then it kind of kept evolving to, to include all the different stories. And I knew that I was definitely interested more than just the love stories is also how we talk about love and how we remember what we remember, what we forget. Mm -hmm. So it was very much um, a project about storytelling uh, in that sense. So, yeah, I thought, I mean, out the two main references that were interesting for me at the time to think of were 1001 Nights, yeah. both um the book and the tv show um and uh and pop music and arab pop music um in the 80s 90s and 2000s so hence this is how sort of um the project evolved to take its current form through working with i mean through first like uh, sound exper experimenting with sound experimenting with language experimenting with the performers then the editing and the sound design like all this sort of um, evolved from these initial inspirations but then started to take its shape um, over time yeah let's talk about all of these different elements um, that were like important to the film like it has a very interesting texture in the sense that there are so many different layers put over each other throughout the course of the film. Um, can you talk a bit about how you constructed this very rich texture of the film and um, how you organized the narrative in this very particular frame in which it takes place? I think maybe Karin, would you like to Talk about yeah, I, I can say a few words about editing, but do you want to talk first about the shooting and about the different uh, like types of uh, images that you were interested in? And then maybe I can... Sure, sure. Yeah, so, um, I mean, we have uh, in the film, it's constructed around or as a structure of a, of a, of a tale, of a Thousand and yeah. One Nights tale. So the interest from the beginning and then it kept evolving was about how this tale is told and using the techniques of 1001 nights the storytelling techniques not just the so no, basically not the content or not, not only the aesthetics but the frame story structure like the story within a story like all these um storytelling forms um so that was definitely one element yeah. Um, and then uh, the other element was the interviews, uh, which are also shot primarily on a green screen, um, which is another 1001 Nights reference, but also to give this indication of, um, of the different possibilities of a space. And then uh, there were the staged scenes. Um, and finally came along the animation and the sketches, which also is something that on the one hand 
are clearly a reference to 1001 Nights the Show because it would always start with animation, then go into, um, how do you call it, like uh, live action, live action. Right. and then you go back to animation and so on and so forth. And um, it helped us also keep and sustain this fantasy, fairy tale feeling throughout. Mm -hmm. So I would I would think about this as the different elements, unless Karina, you think I uh, I missed something? Um, no, and I was just going to add that, uh, like building these different elements together, it's uh, I think it's uh, it's work that happens like at the same time you know in a horizontal way and in a vertical way I would say, because you have to construct characters and then you have to construct one storyline which is like held by the narrator and also you have to construct the storyline uh, with the music and and it and it feels like it's uh, it's uh, we had like four editing phases i would say we didn't have one one uh, continuous editing and so each time it was uh, at first it might have been like okay what do we want to keep because we had so much elements and it was about that. What are we, what what is really important? What is really essential? And and then we started building up the characters, the narration, and I think the the final stages were maybe about uh, how do we say sculpting, sculpting, like like maybe removing, maybe maybe taking a few things and and seeing how things. Uh, how do you say it in English? Um, like maybe transcend or I don't know. Um, so it was a very complex um, uh, process to reach this. Um, and, uh, and to me, I think that uh, it was very important for us to have a very um, rich storytelling, but at the same time to have something about it that will remain uh, simple in a way and not uh, not um, over you know like um, uh, like over um, uh, I forgot the word in English now like it's like maybe or over. sorry yeah over. like, like to, yes to keep something light about it to keep yeah. something also playful about it so it was always this uh, this balance that we had to keep between the richness and like the playfulness and the, and the seriousness and the lightness and there was something like uh yeah i think this was what the editing was about for this film yeah that's very interesting it seems like that mm. a lot came through the process of editing and not the other way around that you had like a very clear strict concept and then the editing had to serve that but kind of the other way around in a way yeah that, that, that that's very interesting let's talk about the soundscape of the film which is similarly to what we have just discussed it's like very layered very rich very different elements um come into play throughout the film and what was also um intriguing is that the sound the, this relationship of sound and image within uh, within the film. Can you elaborate a bit on, on that process? Um, I, I would just start by saying something about the sound and Karina, if you'd like to, uh, to elaborate on it further. Actually, like we worked quite unconventionally when this, with this project mm -hmm. uh, in um, the process itself about image and sound. Uh, so actually, usually the sound designer comes at the very end after like you know, we've done most of the, the editing and then the sound is constructed. In this project, actually the sound designer was the very first person to come on board. Like this was mm. three and a half years ago. Uh, her name is Kinda Hassan. Um, she's a Lebanese uh, um, sound artist uh, uh, living in Paris. And we basically, I think we started the experimentation in 2019. Uh, in a way that created eventually the sonic style for the film, like this kind of over layering. I would I went to to, uh, to Kinda uh, to Paris for a couple of weeks, just started recording things, playing with the colloquial and the classical Arabic and the singing, and starting to layer those. And even if this didn't 
this particular experiment that it make its way to the film it sort of set the the style mm. and there was a lot of back and forth actually between the sound experimentation and the writing process so uh, we shot the process over two years actually so we did some experimentation before then we had the first phase then kinda took the material just as sound to construct things out of them then i took this material actually put it into the script we built it on them so this like the, the process with sound was very like dynamic yeah. and when we started the editing it was the same like we worked actually as kind of a trio me kinda and and karin we were involved like karin was involved in the sound and kinda was involved in the image and uh, yeah. It was it was a very uh, um, how do you say like a kind of a ping pong like process like it it wasn't that uh, sometimes uh, we would actually um, edit things in a specific way to fit an idea that yeah. that Kinda has for the sound etc. Mm -hmm. um, and then also like just to yeah and since we're on it there was also uh, a couple of uh, musicians that uh, also contributed significantly to this. Mm -hmm. So uh, Khayyam uh, Lemi, uh, he was, um, uh, he's, an, he, uh, he, uh, he's also, he's, he's, uh, he's a musician who uh, is living in Berlin at the moment. He's Iraqi and he's living in Berlin. And he um, led the choir um, for, he was the, the Oh, the, yeah, the maestro for the choir, kind of, yeah, mm -hmm. the choir cool. director, yeah, um, and uh, and then uh, like so, so we recorded this also before the second shooting and integrated it into the film and used it significantly. So this was a very important player, yeah. and then finally came uh, Amin Faizabadi who did the original music composition. Um, and through this, we tried to kind of like it's um mainly harp and like a little clarinet piece at the end and the elements of it were constructed in a way to be an, a, an additional layer that keeps bringing us back to the world of 1001 nights to the fairy tale world so you have a lot of this also even within this process there was a lot of back and forth with yeah. amen and kinda and karin like you know uh, kinda did some electroacoustic compositions and then uh, Amin would construct something and then maybe like one of them would say actually you know maybe the other thing is working better here I will mm -hmm. take this off and it, it was a lot of uh, also uh, dialogue um, when it came to the sound yeah yeah all right and would you like anything to add to to that part to to sound any insights on that Karine, do you... Uh, no, I, I just want to say that it's the first time for me to work this way. Uh -huh. And I always wanted to do it like this, you know, like I always wanted to have the sound uh, editor be a partner for me and someone that I can dialogue with and not just, you know, hand in the film and and have someone take over. And, and I personally think that we really succeeded at doing that. <laughs> like on a personal like not as a result me like uh, us between each other i think we like uh, we really figured out how to make this a very enjoyable and very i don't know kind of um kind of a very rewarding process yeah. and i would really like to try to work uh, again this way uh -huh. because it affect it like it changes a lot how i how i work and yeah. it's, uh, it, 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 it brings a lot to, to my process. Yeah, lovely. Let's talk mm -hmm. about performance and the performative elements of, of, the, of the work. Um, there are many voices coming into, into this narrative. There are quite many performers. Um, I was wondering uh, how did you find um, the performers for the piece? How was it to work with them? To what extent were the performances based on um, on, on prescripted uh, words? How much was it improvisation? 
how was getting into the 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 storylines and into these different narrative elements of the film for for the performers so in general about about the performative part of this piece uh, I will just only start by saying that uh, I'll answer the question about uh, how do yeah. how, how do they come together yeah and the zero can talk a bit more about the performance Ahmed. Uh, and um, I didn't do a casting for the main characters, uh, so I actually approached directly um, okay. the people that I wanted to work with. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and that, that was also, they, they came in at different points in time. Uh, like Ahmad and Salim came at, 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 the, at the very beginning, and then uh, uh, Nadim came in um, a little later. Hassan like started was with us in the first year, and then the, the, the I wanted to expand the the um, the space for the for the character with Ahmad uh, with Awadalla. It was also um, like interestingly enough, like he was the first one that we did. Like I did a, this interview experiment with, to, just also as a way to set the style for it. Yeah. But then we worked on his character the second year, so there were a lot of people sort of coming um, in and out of the process. But all of them were people that I just reached out to directly for for many reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't know the process itself. Uh, to you? Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. So for me, something that was very like also attractive about this project is that there's a lot of voices and when you say when I meant voices also not that only there are different stories that are all intertwining and uh, kind of feeding back information and narratives to each other but also that the, um, the whole crew and cast and people who are singing and editing like we're all kind of working together which also makes more sense with the idea of that this is about different love stories or different lovers' narratives or different uh, perspective of what um, our experience of the fantasy of love or the relationships are. So I think the more these voice, like I think there's still, of course, the solid um, line that you can follow. But it's for me, it's very nice that this is always like keeps confusing itself and coming back. To, mm. to the beginning and the end and like so that was already clear from the beginning even if the narrative was not yet figured out fully but it was clear that this is um, the approach for the process itself and with um, like yeah also it took different stages because for me as well like my at least contribution was in different parts of the project and uh, um yeah, like, it, like improvisation or not is is always present because I also me and other people working on the film are more experienced with dance and performance and stage mm -hmm. uh, uh, work. So it is um, likely that we like to also play with instant composition and body and and uh, improvisation and text and words. So. It's collab collaborative in that sense, but of course there is uh, like lines that we are kind of trying to arrive to. And then there is room either at the beginning to choose anchor points together or uh, mm -hmm. improvise in the moment. And the same goes for the singing, the same goes for uh, yeah many things. So I felt, yeah, it's, I don't know if I'm answering the question fully, but it's, it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, a mix of a mix of uh, input. So the plurality makes yeah. sense, and also the uh, yeah, yeah, right. The I mean, at, at the end of the day, at the center of this film is love and relationships, and um, what we what what is a relationship in general, and and how. Um, how these emotions around around love and and connecting with other people um, change and transform and get stronger and get weaker over over time. Um, but this is a very particularly queer take 
on on this subject. Can you um, can you explain a bit about your your approach to to depicting queer love and and queer relationships? Mm. Um, I mean, one of the very first things that we thought about and that also kept us like sort of in check always again something that um is how do you how do you um what is the queer experience in the fullest sense of the term so it's not only about a relationship between two men or two women or like the different spectrum of, of queerness but it's also about how we experience time and how we experience space and how we experience relationships in a way uh, that has influenced a lot how we ended up telling the story, like whether it's about fragmentation or about multiplicity or about parallel uh, um, relationships happening at the same time or fantasy or imagination. Uh, so that was, I think, what we focused and was always the kind of thing that we kept talking about, like in the process over and over. And, um, and I must say also that the performance, uh, the performers gave us really, really great material for the editing because they like, as, as Ahmed was saying that sometimes you have, maybe you, you know that we're asking this question or you will know that we want to arrive at certain things, or maybe we know that, there's a few parts that kind of cues that we need somehow, but a lot of it within, like sometimes would, it was just always really nice surprises that uh, I think when we were editing, like were really helping us in this, in the, in this kind of uh, the weaving of the story, you know, mm -hmm. like the, you can ask someone what happened and then they say like, I don't know, you tell me what's happened. So, you know, and then is, this is just like a way mm -hmm. to get into another, um, uh, another space and another time and another yeah. exactly. Yeah, I see. Um, it was one recurring question or sentence that also structured the narrative was, I wonder why we keep telling stories we already know, mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting in the sense as well, just sort of like reflecting back on, on creating a film which are very often telling stories that we've heard before, that we've seen before. Um, can you tell a bit about this, this element in the film that was so crucial, like kind of like a pillar within the film that like structured everything sort of orbited around um, mm -hmm. this question? I mean, yeah, it's it's a recurrent theme that keeps that keeps coming, and also at some point in time, when one of the, let's say, actually like the main interlocutor somehow, or the guy Salim, yeah. like the stories are sort of structured around the conversations that yeah. that we have together, and then he he uh, uh, when he also says that you know it's the same story it keeps getting repeated, and this is why, I think it was interesting for us again. It's not just sharing these relationships and these stories but very much um, trying to reflect on it within the scope of the storytelling and in a way that wasn't um, like we it, this actually became very clear in the editing at, uh, like after the first editing phase that we didn't want to make a film about memory or we didn't want to make a film that reflects on memory or reflects on repetition we wanted the film to perform those things. Uh -huh. So even those reflexive texts came very much as always part, like our guide at, at towards the end was always part of um, uh, something that also advances the story or, or, I mean, advances it in whichever way that means, advances forward, backwards, whatever. But, um, and this is actually something that we took very much from uh, the way Shahrazad tells the stories in 1001 Nights. Mm -hmm. um, that if you actually go and look at the texts um, of, of 1001 Nights, it's a lot of uh, like action verbs. It's a lot of, you know, this happened and this person did this and this person did that. Mm -hmm. And so we kept the reflection always within, in the film you'll always find it within something that's also doing something else. 
Like it's yeah. it's we never had a text that says a full text about uh, about stories that keep repeating themselves or about this. But as as you're saying, exactly keeps coming just sort of casually within narratives that are already taking place. Um, so yeah. I, yeah. that's, that, that's how I think of it. Yeah. You touched upon multiple times the, the, the temporal aspect of the film and this very special temporality that the, that the film creates, um, which for me worked on two different levels as well. I mean, on the one hand, of course, it's time doesn't flow in this um, progressive linear line uh, within the narrative as like in, in a normative sense it would um, and then based on that how these different elements and the different reference points that you use come into the story it also created a bit of a an archival sense for for the film um, can you talk about these different temporal elements a bit more in depth because I thought that was very very exciting about about the project how that gets challenged and and reconfigured throughout the project Karin would you like to or would I yeah uh, yeah I think I think the thing is that um, we all want to, we want the things to be multiple I think this is what what was like our goal you know like 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 it's like about we're talking in the present but it's not about the present but at the same time we have to have this interaction with what has is being said and not just like reminiscence it's and I think it's like show he said it's about doing a film about the in action and not about uh, like the kind of meta of, of reflecting about it. So we, we really wanted the whole form to, we wanted it to be organic, you know? We didn't want it to be something a bit uh, like a theory of that. So we tried lots of, so I don't know, you can find, for example, um, uh, uh, for example, with the Selim character, which is the person we are telling supposedly, we supposedly, the narrator met him and he spent the night with him. And then he, and he's telling him all these stories. So this is, was something that wasn't like, this was something that we invented in the editing. It wasn't like, this is not how it was supposed to be. Yeah. And, but, but then we, we used this character and he kept coming and he gave us like a sense at the same time, a sense of uh, uh, like, like stability or like, okay, something is repeating. So, okay, we're okay, we're still following. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he would also be the person who's like, you never told me that. So you, so, so there was, there, there's always, we always wanted this mixture between like something that's um, not confusing, but like, like the, the stories are ongoing. It is the same story. Each character has a, an arc. But also we, we we wanted to to deconstruct that a little bit, yeah. you know. We we didn't want to be like, okay, so did he go out with this one before this one or after this one? Or we we, we didn't want to get into this. We we just wanted it to be like uh, something a friend of ours said about the film that was really nice. It's like it's about the lover in general. Yeah. And in, in Arabic music, there's a lot. That we use this term a lot, you know, we say Habibi, but it means, it sometimes it means the lover, you know, it doesn't specifically mean, it means like the figure of the lover, yeah. the, the, the something bo bit more, um, you know, like, yeah, it's like the archetype, uh, of the, archetype, the, yeah, 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 yeah. So we were always trying to balance between this, between the, the details of one story, but at the same time, this story represents something bigger. Hmm. And I think, I think the only way, one of the ways to do that in film is also related to time. Yeah. You know, is also because, is also how to, how do you, how do you work time? How do you choose not to have it, uh, you know, like not to be bound with one chronology and how to um, disrupt it yeah. sometimes. Uh, yeah. 
Um, yeah, and if I may add something also, I think that at the end, like many, many, many things in the film, um, we, we wanted not to answer the questions about time, but let time itself be a question and yeah. space at the same time. You know, it's not yeah. like we, 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 this idea of unclarity and the, the temporal, let's say, like even um, exactly a temporal ambiguity within the film. Because is, did it all happen in one night or then, yeah. you know, and then which lover is she, is she talking about at the end? Like, you know, it's... Uh, it just like just like the space was always a question and the stories were a question and time itself became a question and at one point in time in the editing process we should sort of made this decision i mean it was also in, in during the performance but again in the editing that we don't want to answer these questions and that all of this is much more interesting for us if they just remain as questions in the film uh -huh. yeah yeah but then it was interesting in that sense as well that this could take place today, but it could take place, I don't know, 50 years ago, or it could take place 20 years from now in the future. Uh, so there was also on this level, like time broke down in, in a way and it was handled differently. I don't think it's an or, it's an and, because uh -huh. this it's and because some of these things took place 15 years ago and some of these things did not take place yet and you know like so well then it's, it's more like then together. transposing different times yeah. upon each uh, other yeah exactly uh -huh. not yeah not choosing between them yeah yeah nice i also find this very like relatable in the in terms of the uh, internal experience with with time especially when it comes to remembering things or telling a story about a lover or one song that I used to listen to when I was younger and then now it triggers something else because I went through another experience and then maybe right. I'm imagining or fantasizing about something that might happen but for me what feels like longer or shorter or recent or uh, not triggering anymore because it has been too long or I experience it differently and then I'm talking about it so all, all this play on memory and the internal experience of of time in the mind, uh, playing with thoughts and emotions and all of that is very much similar to that, I find, especially in these uh, moments when something happens with a lover or when something happens with, uh, like there's this sudden, like like some ruptures, they they make time very loose. Mm -hmm. And and this yes. is something that I experience and I, I hear from many people. and. It makes even more sense than a chronological or or a clear time narrative. Yeah, super fascinating for sure. Um, it is a it is a, in on some in some way it's it's a very male centered um, film that we see. The male body in particular is is very central to this piece. What was your approach to? Yeah, to the filming and to the positioning of of the male body and and the portrayal of of yeah male towards male desire um, in the film. Um, I mean, okay. First of all, it's a personal film, also. Yeah. So the it's in the eye voice, right? Which which um, which meant that the way that the the male body or the way that the even the the, the the male presence overall in the film is coming it's actually all based on the viewpoint of the narrator and mm -hmm. coming from the imagination and the the let's say the the, the um, aesthetic world also of the narrator um and at the same time it's it was it, what I was interested in doing, and I think also happened a lot more in the editing process, was how these two worlds are com are conflated or like are are um, uh, uh, overlayered. This yeah. parallel world between the the desire, the imagination, the interest in the male body, and um, the female narrator, who is actually connecting and actually advancing the story forward and 
takes on different forms, uh, not just aesthetically, like in the yeah. different costumes and different, but also like she's the storyteller, but also she's sometimes the confidant, she's sometimes mm. the caretaker, sometimes she takes on the position of the narrator, like when she's singing, for example, with yeah. the voice of the eye, um, or when she comes after a hard moment, or when she's coming to bless a certain moment. Um, and that was sort of also in a way, um, um, let's say, I mean, like an appreciation of the, of the, of this like companionship and, and, and friendship. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so, so that these two things could be working together that even for, I mean, it, because the narrator is a gay man, so yeah. it just makes, of course, a lot of sense that the, the interest and the obsession and, um, and, and, and eventually the, the visual, the visual aesthetic style of the film overall is dominated by that. But then also, at least what we wanted to do is to always have this acknowledgement of the female presence, whether as the narrator who moves the, the, the event, or also when the moment when, when female characters come in right. at a moment of uh, support and at a moment of uh, um, crisis and they, um, they are the ones who also show up, the girlfriends. So yeah. we, we, we try to kind of play a little bit with, the, um, with these two sort of uh, uh, parallel uh, presences somehow. Yeah, in a like in a way, after finishing the film, after watching it, um, and and once again, like this word, sort of comes to mind this this archival sense a bit to it. It it became like an archive of these different queer sensibilities. We talked about it that yeah, it it happened fifty years ago. It happens now. It will happen in 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 twenty years. So that like somehow the film nicely encapsulates these, these particularly queer struggles in love and, and, and relationships. What, what is your take on, on such reading of the film? What, what, what do you mean again on the archival? Uh, yeah, that it, 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 it's like an archive of these different queer sensibilities. So, I mean, I was, uh, the, 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 um, the archive and document was something that was always quite interesting for me, yeah. even though in this film in particular, uh, with very, very few exceptions, we, we, we almost never used anything as it is somehow. So in that sense, I think what I would feel that we have in the film is actually more an archive of references more than an archive of a direct archive in that sense and if if that's i don't know i think maybe that's what you meant you, right. or in this direction we mean the archive of sensibilities that we're also creating our own archive exactly. uh, and this was very important to us that we're not yes we are using these songs but we're also using them in our world and we're using them in our way and when ahmad is singing this song like he's also owning it and and transforming it in his own way and when we are um, uh, even the, the monologues of Shahrazad are all, um, or most, many of them are based on real monologues. Some of them are just, so like we created from scratch yeah. and some of them, so it was a way also to relate to this material, yeah. uh, if archive, if you will, uh, but also in a way that, uh, that makes it personal because there's also a lot of things that are problematic with these references. And this is what we want to, like this kind of relationship that we all had, like we love this music, but it's very problematic. We love these singers, but they're very homophobic. And even 1001 Nights was also was incredibly racist and misogynist. And so how do we want to take uh, these elements and material that we love, that we grew up with, that we still relate to, but we actually create our own version of them, that we um, make them our own without such, or, or like we kind of release them in a way from all these mm -hmm. problematic aspects, so. Yeah, yeah, that's more so what I meant, that like the film itself becomes an archive, not 
not like that you would use necessarily like archival documents or archival yes. footage in yes. it, but that the film would live sort of as an archive of different sensibilities. Like somehow that was at least my my feeling about it and, and my takeaway. Well, I would like to thank all three of you for being here with us today and, and talking about this very fascinating and, and rich um, film. Um, I wish you all the best for the Berlinale. Thank you very much. Thank you.